Something I ask myself in every project is two questions. The first one is, why am I making this? And I want that to be a very honest and personal response. But then the second question would be, why should people care about this body of work? It's so easy to say that my demographic for my work is myself, like, because it makes me happy. If you're putting it out there and there's an audience who's looking at your work, they need to get something out of it too. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Uh, today we've got a, I guess I could call you an old friend now, just because you're getting on in years. <laughs> getting out of school anytime I can call someone like in their 20s old is fun <laughs> now that I'm not in my 20s but uh met you almost four years ago now uh three three yeah three. 2016 and who your name is probably Joel or Joel maybe may, Joel maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Joel probably Joel he goes by probably Joel and his Instagram handle is Pika Pika P-E-E-K-U-H all right, there you go. And he's got a very interesting feed. I'd, I'd look him up if I were you. Um, but we had you on today because you worked as the behind-the-scenes photographer in a documentary that I'm continue to work on, mm -hmm. continuing to work on still. And that was about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, through working with you on that, we realized that you were a very uh, creative person that uh, was very interesting and uh fun to interact with. So I thought it would be fun to have you on. But to give you even more background for those of you who don't know Joel, a uh, conceptual artist who explores, approach, uh, explores approaches to storytelling and documentary through a multidisciplinary practice spanning photography, filmmaking, virtual reality, sound design, and interactive installations. Undergraduate study in new media at Maine College of Art and a graduate certificate in documentary studies at Salt Institute. Master of Fine Arts uh, at Maine College of Art. In your spare time, reads dark humor, memoirs, and plays the chromatic harmonica. So you there you go. You read my website. What's that? You read my website. Uh, Tim read your website. I read what Tim wrote down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, so I, I was very happy that we made the decision to have you come along as our uh, behind the scenes photographer because you were uh, quiet as a church mouse, but very uh, interesting and engaging uh, to talk to when when engaged. And you just did a really great job. Uh, and like we didn't have to ask you to do anything. Like you you knew what you had to do and you did it and you did it consistently and well. That was really cool. But um, just wanted to have you on to talk to you about your very unique approach to seemingly everything you do from like playing the chromatic harmonica to when when I watch your Instagram post you've always got very interesting pictures or you're creating music or like doing all kinds of things so I think this will be an interesting conversation long story short but uh tell me about how you felt about the uh three weeks we spent in close confines going across the country and and reflecting back on that how you, how you think about it to start you're out asking me about three weeks from three years ago yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i thought it was a really good time i'm not saying this because i'm on camera <laughs> um joel is not any longer sponsored by trump bell photography so not anymore but poland springs maybe poland springs maybe yeah Made home and design. Yeah, this is just for us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, it was an eye-opening experience. And there are a couple things that I did on the road that was, like, on my bucket list. Oh, yeah? I checked off. What I were don't those? remember them. But um, visiting Salt Flats. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Those were really cool. And going to Hardee's. Hardee's? Yeah, do you we remember that? We went to Hardee's? We went to Hardee's. I must have blanked out. I think it was somewhere in Virginia. We we're like making our way up. <laughs> Do you remember that? We went to Hardee's. I remember going through Virginia, but I don't remember going to Hardee's. That's funny. Or maybe we went by a Hardee's and I was like, man, I want to go to Hardee's. And we might have ended up going to getting Indian. Huh. Do you remember that? I, I remember Indian. I think it was that somewhere night. Somewhere in Virginia. It's, it's right across the street. 
like when I think about that trip across the country mm-hmm. and the visual creativity just involved in every way, shape and form, mm-hmm. it must be really interesting for someone like yourself with your background coming from a very highly populated, dense area like Hong Kong mm-hmm. uh, to just go across an expansive country like America that's all one country but different states and then to see the different kind of zones geography somewhat different culture it was definitely humbling yeah it was really humbling to kind of see the country being so geographically diverse you know oh yeah we went through like northwest down through california and then Mm -hmm. across the desert i loved the desert from like uh, Las Vegas north up to the salt flats was probably one of my favorite parts. And then through Wyoming was just... Yeah, but the bit before that when we had like the alternator issues. Yeah, like... That, I mean, that was fun. That was through California and Nevada. That was... Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, that that north and south valley there, mm-hmm. north of Las Vegas both ways was really cool. I mm-hmm. liked those areas a lot. Uh, what was your visual takeaway from that that diversity? What What still sits with you? Um, hmm. I just like, I just think the diversity is cool. Like yep. you're say, I think of all the places I've been to, you know, like mostly big cities and I don't really, I've never owned a car. Yeah. So I don't really like get to drive between cities, mostly just flying, occasionally a train or a bus really just to see the landscape slowly change yeah yeah um that was really eye-opening for me what was your what were what was visually the most favorite part of the country for you visually um i think the whole northern to southern california the whole like stretch along the coast yeah and just seeing like i kind of i remember my first impression of um the california area was that it felt like Maine, but everything was scaled up. Right. Yeah, that's the Northwest. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like the Northeast, but scaled up. That's a good good way of putting it. I've yeah. often thought that Maine is very similar to like British Vancouver, uh, but just scaled like what? Like they just took the stretch tool, and mm-hmm. <laughs> brought it up. When you're when you're working in that manner, like as a bes- behind the scenes photographer approaching mm-hmm. a subject like like ours that we were working on. What what is your approach and thought process, and and what captures your eye when you're shooting? Um. So I've always kind of went for like kind of fly on the wall approach that I really just wanted to be an observer. I want to be as invisible as possible, but also present at the same time. Do you know what I'm saying? I think so. Describe it further for me. <laughs> um. So there are times where. Like, say when we're trying to fix the van in Las Vegas in yep. some parking lot, that I know that on one hand, I'd probably be able to help by, you know, like maybe get some water, you know, um, help move stuff around. But at the same time, that's not my role there. Even right. though I'm an extra pair of hands, I am the set of eyes to make sure you remember what happened along the The frustration road. that there was no one there to go get water. It was, it's more important that you walk away at the end of it having documented those moments rather than alleviating those moments. Yeah, so I think um, having been through documentary studies and um, just reading journalism and whatnot, a lot of times people have this like moral dilemma that as a photojournalist, do you help someone who is... Um, in need who is dying or do you pick up your camera and right. photograph that moment what what is the take on that y'all are adults you're not gonna die um i'm here to document so i feel like one thing that's good is throughout most of the trip well i mean I was, like from a from a documentary school perspective mm-hmm. like what what do they teach you on that as far as like in 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 desperate situations they don't really teach you that i mean like it's really up to you, like as a person, which side do you take and you make your own judgment. Yeah. Like that, uh, that photo in the last five years of that, um, I would want to say little Syrian boy or girl that washed up on a shore in, I think in Italy somewhere, I forget, but 
it, it was where refugees were coming across, I mm -hmm. think the Mediterranean or something. Uh, and, a, and a child had drowned and washed up. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading an article about the photographer that captured that image. And it's like, he just was just distraught at the moment, but knew that that image would, mm -hmm. uh, bring so much more attention to the entire situation. And man, it was, ooh, it was, it was hard to see, but there was, there's so much value in telling the truth about that situation, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that, uh, I think is, is just so important. Um, creatively, what moments do you look for and compositionally, how do you work with that? Um, so in terms of composition, I think I remember when we had our first meeting interview, um, that was at Arabica coffee in Portland. Yep. Um, and I was showing you my work. And I think a couple of things that caught your eye were, um, I did a project in Malaysia where I photographed some um, apartment complexes and mm. knowing you're an architectural photographer, yep. maybe it was like kind of a good icebreaker. And back then, and even now, like some of my photographic work kind of have a little bit of like that Wes Anderson vibe, very yeah. like center composed, very orderly. Um, so that was kind of like a personal influence, like of how I make my work and how I like seeing my photographs. Um, so that's more stylistic, but in terms of moments that I look for, again, um, I like to be a fly on the wall. Um, I try to avoid eye contact. Mm -hmm. I try to avoid being acknowledged. So it's really just catching those in between moments. Like right. I remember there's photo of, um, I think we're all at a parking lot and um, Chet, that's his name, yep. right? Chet, um, Chet was like either about to like lay down at a parking lot and there was just like this photo where I captured him mid motion where he's like falling. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, we were in a, I think at a, um, a rest stop and Caleb was endlessly working and we were all waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was that the case? Yeah, and I think that's the time that we took off to get ahead of him because we were in the slower van, mm -hmm. and we took some of his stuff that he had to be able to work, mm -hmm. and then when they caught back up to us, he was really upset. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> you got a good photo of it, and, but I knew I wasn't in the wrong because I just I had no clue, and I wasn't trying to be, mm -hmm. you know, manipulate his working situation, so I just kind of let him vent, and then I was like, I'm sorry I did that. I really didn't intend to do that, and blah, blah. And the funny part was, as soon as I did that, he's like, that's really good interpersonal skills. You Like, his <laughs> manager mind was like, man, if I could hire people like that that could handle a situation like that, that'd be great. And it was, like, it was funny. It just kind of dissipated, like, in a snap of a finger, which was interesting. But um, that trip built character. <laughs> for everybody. Yeah. Well, it, it was interesting for me. It helped me. I mean, for in a lot of ways, I mean, I for one, learned a lot from all the interviews we did, which by the way, this trip that we're talking about is a, is a documentary on faith that I'm working on still, uh, and the loss of faith. And we interviewed a lot of psychologists, religious leaders, scientists, you name it. Um, but the, the real takeaways that I got that from that were for one, just all the interviews we did were really interesting. will were really interesting. Um, I learned a lot about the people I was with. I learned, you know, how good of a person Tim is to work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, yeah, there were just so many takeaways from there and, and character building, but I also learned that like I was very invested in that. And I realized that I was probably pushing everyone to go much as far as I was willing to go, but you have to learn as a, manager or someone who's owning the project, right? Mm -hmm. That you have to understand that you've got far more, uh, morale to give to it, to push yourself further. Like, and you know, Chet kept telling me like, we need to slow down. We need to take a rest. You know, everyone's getting worn out. And I'm like, I've got 110% energy because this is my baby and I'm just going to keep going. And, and it was, it was an interesting learning curve to like, all right, yeah, it's 
probably a good idea. We need to like, let's just take a day off here and not, mm -hmm. you know, um, but you know, first time for everything. So who's that guy we interviewed who, when he found out that you, what hit 20 interviews in like what? 20 oh, I days, forget like, who that was, but I remember that crazy. being said and they're like, what? But yeah. I mean, we did it and we kind of wanted to kill each other by the end of it, but <laughs> it's, I was pretty sad about it. You, yeah, you had a good time overall. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's See, good. like that's kind of the fly on the wall thing. Like I'm not really in the. Yeah, conflict. you're not in the emotional suit, but you're watching it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and you got some great images from it too, which was which is really cool. Um, tell me about your journey from Hong Kong to Maine. Like, that's kind of being from a perspective of Maine. That's kind mm -hmm. of crazy. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people have asked me that question, but. I don't really have a good answer. It's all happenstance, you know? Really? Yeah. Um, I think I've always wanted to visit the States. And um, I think when it came down to my last year of high school, I took the SATs. Um, I started looking for colleges. I think I had in mind I was kind of between doing journalism or, um, or art. I think those were two things I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And... I was given a few cues. My mother said, you know, pick the East Coast. Why? I think she just felt like it was more um, studious, you know, more academic oriented really? side of the country. Rather than the West Coast. That's funny. Yeah. But I mean, like, it, it makes sense. All the Ivy Leagues are in the East Coast. I guess. Yeah. Um, Maine has three little Ivies. So that's pretty cool. What are they? I think Colby, it's Bates. Colby, Bates. Bowden? Maybe. Hmm. Mini Ivies. <laughs> yeah. That's what they're called, apparently. Um, but, yeah, no, I just picked a couple of art schools in the East Coast. Uh, I think I got accepted to study journalism in somewhere in New York. I don't really remember where it is anymore. But I think 20, 2011, 2012 was around the time that I think it was the Chicago Sun Times fired all their photojournalists, and then I kind of read that and I was like, uh, maybe mm. not journalism for the meanwhile. Right. And I applied to a couple of art schools. Uh, MassArt rejected me. Uh, they looked at my transcript and said, "You don't, you didn't take enough art classes." Uh, yeah. But there's only art as a class, so whatever. <laughs> and then Maine College of Art accepted me like in a heartbeat. So I just kind of had that as like the baseline. Right. I'll just do it. And then I'm here. Uh, wow. I'm getting a lot of emails right now. Um, I probably silence my phone too. <laughs> so what is it about Maine that grabs you? I mean, visually, culturally, uh, you know, coming from your background mm -hmm. of Hong Kong, Maine's a drastic difference i've been to hong kong and it's mm -hmm. incredible and not to say that means not incredible but it, they're incredibly different yeah um i think i wanted to be immersed in a different culture you know like i think i was just reflecting on this a couple of days ago i never really felt like i belonged in hong kong i just hmm. never really like um like the pop culture there. And mm. I was actually just telling someone that, you know, Cantonese pop music hasn't really like changed in the past 20 years. They're all just power ballads. <laughs> That's going to be the quote we're going to pull out and put on the thumbnail of this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And I remember growing up, I would spend a lot of time on the internet. I would talk to people, I'll talk to strangers. That's kind of really how I honed my English. Um, I really admired the different cultures out there. So I wanted to be out there. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, when I was 12, I went through Japan, Hong Kong, and the Philippines with my parents. Mm -hmm. And it, it is an intense, like super active, mm -hmm. just, just neon powered, intense, like, I mean, I'm talking Tokyo and Hong Kong. Right. Um, I get it. But yeah, there is, there is that, Pop, you know, it's like pop culture turned up. Was that sure. like late 80s, early 90s? 
Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to date you. <laughs> Don't trying to date me. I did buy a really nice Kyosho Altima while I was there, though RC car. Mm-hmm. I, I remember before we went, my dad told me with the exchange rates, I could save up enough money and like my money would double to be able to get like a really good RC car. So I saved up a bunch and nice bought one there in Hong Kong and took it to the Philippines where we were going to be for a bit. And my dad and I put it together and it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the, the kind of slower pace of life kind of a, attracted you uh, in Maine to a degree. I think the change of pace was really nice. I mean, even, are you familiar with my project and loneliness and, hmm. um, so it, it wasn't an ongoing project. I kind of like called it good last year, but then, so, and loneliness and is a, uh, photo series I've been working on between 2015 and 2018 mm-hmm. where I would go out in Portland at night, like the greater Portland area wander around and photograph nightscapes. Well, I, I love the night stuff that you, you seem to really gravitate towards those night shots. And I remember in mm-hmm. your portfolio that you originally showed me, I really love like the, cause you get these stark, these, you know, really contrasty colors mm-hmm. and, and a lot of different colors that are singular within the dark negative space. Yeah. And really I feel cool. like that's a very, like it stood out to me because that doesn't exist in Hong Kong. Like, Oh. it's something that I kind of realized between doing and loneliness and thank you. And Tim just brought me coffee. He's the best. <laughs> two sugar cubes Two. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's sugar cubes or packets. Yeah. So, um, and Loneliness and really drew me as a photo series because it was really in Portland or somewhere that's not as populated like Hong Kong or a big city right. that you'd get these isolated moments. Uh, of, of like a gas station by itself yeah. and being a little light pool and then mm-hmm. blackness, whereas like Hong Kong, Tokyo, everything's this crazy light like that. Yeah. like. And I noticed you mm-hmm. were in Hong Kong recently. Yep. And the one like the general memory i have of the images you posted were more so these moments that were mostly all dark and then like neon writing singularly Mm -hmm. by itself which are yeah i and you're using a sony still yep still same camera yeah and the files you can get out of those as you showed us when we were going across the country i think chet bought one after that trip as well but didn't he sell it after well, yeah, again, to get into the technical, I I hate the user interface on oh, Sony. They're so like it Canon's just like it's 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 out there and the user experience is just so much better, but the files you can get out of the Sony's mm-hmm. are especially with that night stuff that you do is is really really Yeah, cool. and I've been telling people because I think you know this before I was a Sony shooter, I had a 5D Mark 3. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I use it as a backup camera right. throughout the trip, but didn't really get much use out of it um but the way i've been telling people is the canon is a great camera and the sony is a computer with a great sensor on it right it's not fun to shoot with it's kind of sluggish at times because i'm using a four-year-old camera at this point but i'm willing to take that hit because i know when i sit in my in front of my computer and look at the files i've got work to do i've got more than I need. So right. bottom line is the files that the Sony produces um, leaves me very little room to blame my equipment. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of a discipline at that point. Right. Yeah. So so back to the your current art project mm-hmm. and these nightscapes that you do. Tell me tell me more about those and why Maine kind of brought these out for you. I think it was just how differently the cities were illuminated and even in my my master's thesis research i talked about um the hong kong photo series as well as the body of work i produce including a neon sculpture some sound art and backlit prints that light operates differently in different spaces right so i think of um say hong kong and a lot of east asian uh, metropolitans that they're kind of like 
the origin or a visual inspiration for cyberpunk, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you think of the franchises like Ghost in the Shell and um, Blade Runner. These are all like neon ridden and you see these kind of like faux Chinese characters and whatnot. And that's kind of like what drew people to Hong Kong at night sometimes, right? You've got, um, there's this photographer named Greg Girard who did a photo essay called City of Darkness. I think it was around the 80s. He photographed the Kowloon Walled City at night and they're all like very grim and dark. It looks like a dystopian cluster of people and buildings. Right. Um, and then on the other hand, in Maine, I remember um, speaking to Center for Maine Contemporary Arts, uh, Suzette McAvoy, mm -hmm. and she told me that their new um, art center was kind of designed around the idea of the Maine light that drew, uh, drew artists to Maine over the years, that like the light is just beautiful for the artist to make landscape paintings. So I kind of put two and two together and kind of really used my opportunity as a photographer, a light painter, right. um, to study light, to see how light operates differently, how it illuminates the cities differently. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think some of the images that I was capturing personally after the trip were very influenced by your work because oh. I, I remember um when we got back and when we were going across the country thinking all right i like this stuff that joel's doing mm -hmm. i want to like experiment in similar manners and one of the first instagram posts i got when i got back with the you know the van that we bought out there was like a really really early morning shot it looked still looked like night but it was like uh, at the 7-eleven over mm -hmm. here with a van pulled up to it and so it was that kind of light pool you know mm -hmm. and and I tried to on on Instagram use the editing features to make it look like like Joel's photos, but you know it was. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I got the Mark IV like right when we got back from that trip too. I think you did. Yeah, because I still had the Mark Threes because we were filming with those, and I remember Greg Boyd in his interview kept going back and forth, and the Mark Threes didn't have follow focus for mm -hmm. for the face and mm -hmm. i remember going back and looking at the footage and i was just like ah he's in and out of focus constantly but mm -hmm. whatever let me learn um let's see i'm going through my interesting questions here that tim helped me with he's great with questions why do you get to prepare for questions and i can't like prepare for what to expect oh it's better it's more off the cuff that way <laughs> um it's mostly things I don't want to miss talking about. Uh huh. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So you're you're one of the more interesting creative people that I know. Oh no, interesting is a loaded word. Well, you're an odd person. I mean, you're definitely uh, yeah, kind of yeah. I mean, and and I value that because good grief, you can. You know, you can run into people that like, yeah, it seems like the last person. But, you know, you run into Joel and there's this kind of quirky smile and quietness, but there's a lot going on, you know, and it's just kind of like and Caleb, too. Like he'll talk about it. And he's like, yeah, he's an interesting guy to talk to. I need to. Y'all are interesting. <laughs> Y'all are interesting weird. in your own right. You're just weird. But what I what is creativity to you and 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 why do you why have you chosen to further yourself in that specific realm and, and your output and your way of finding what you're going to do with your life through creativity? Why have you chosen that and what is it to you? You know, I just earned my MFA and they don't, they don't teach you how to answer that question still. Well, I know. I'm asking a personal question here. Yeah. So, um, I think like on creativity, um, I think first thing I would quote is John Baldessari, conceptual artist. Um, and there's this one interview I think LACMA did, narrated by Tom Waits. And um, Baldessari gave three pieces of advice for young artists. One, talent is cheap. Two, um, you must be possessed, which you cannot will. What's that mean? That means um, you have to be possessed by what you're doing, but you can't will it. 
like you, you can't force it. Mm. Like it has to come innately within you. Right. It's kind of like telling people do what you enjoy. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. But it's in a more kind of like mystified way. Yep. Which yep. You know, suits his personality. And the third piece of advice is being at the right place at the right time. Right. And um, some people argue that at some point as a creative person or a maker, cultural producer, artist, which, whatever you want to call it, um, at some point when you make it kind of your uh, career, it's not just about waiting for inspiration. It becomes, it becomes a literal discipline that you have to mm. continue on whether you feel like you want to do this or not. Right. Because you've kind of committed to it. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Um, so far, I haven't really had a huge problem with it. I think... What would be the problem? Kind of running out of motivation um, or ideas or inspiration. Have you found there to be an ebb and flow in that? There has been, but not so much that it has deterred me um, or like stopped me dead in my tracks. Right. I think, so one thing I tried to do in my graduate studies is I kind of really went into the program with my photo portfolio, but at the same time, I knew I didn't want to limit myself to photo. It was just one thing I liked doing, and I happened to be pretty decent at it. But I also wanted to explore other realms. Right. So I really picked up on a lot of other skills. I went back into SALT. I did my graduate studies in documentary studies. And through there, I have um, met some really talented radio storytellers and have tremendous respect for people who do podcasts, who do audio work. And then going back in their program, I did some text work, um, some three-dimensional sculptures. So it's really trying to pick up something that would keep me interested for a while before I lose interest in it. And mm. when I'm kind of like low on that creative juice, I think... Transfer to another medium? Yeah, or the fact that, you know, like I could, I could approach being a maker in two ways. I could either be something that someone's already done, but be so good at it that no one else can match. Or I could just put two things together that no one's done before. And I find myself in the latter more often than I am in the former. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, it's, a, it's an interesting subject or situation to look at the emotional tax of working as a creative. Mm -hmm. I, and just being someone that people call creative, right? There, mm -hmm. there are... There are personality types that, in general, the mass of people say, yeah, it's very creative. Mm -hmm. You know, people have said that to me a lot. But I also <clears throat> find that there's a correlation between those types of people uh, suffering with depression or just being more emotionally volatile, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, there's something about creative <laughs> people that might not be able to immediately expound us upon something with really good recall and being eloquent mm -hmm. but they can work through their medium to produce something profound right and it seems to me that creative people seem to have more connection like all of their brain is communicating in a lighter manner but together at the same time and they also perceive a lot more at the same time so smells visual feeling everything like everything is coming and going very quickly and communicating and there's an ability to pull from all of these parts and create from that uh with more effectiveness rather than being able to focus on one thing for an extended amount of time and do that one thing well like you're saying switching up before you lose motivation the same reason probably why i've had as many cars as years I've been married. My wife complains about this, but I say, hey, one wife, many cars. Tim and I actually talked about it on our way here because we yeah. saw your new, your new van. Yeah, you got a problem. <laughs> um, but I think there's, there's a degree at which there's that thing that gives you the ability that's kind of like the aperture being wide open for your 
brain, right? Mm-hmm. In that you perceive more and and uh, process more, and you're able to be creative because of that. But at the same time, as a human, it wears you down in ways, tends you towards introversion and more emotional volatility. Mm-hmm. I think that, to me, that's why those things seem to coincide, if that's the right word. Um, and I'm, and I think there there has to be a a lot of awareness of that and maintenance of yourself as a person, especially if you're going to subject yourself to making a living through doing that. Because if you're gonna go check in nine to five and do work for someone else that they tell you to do, compared to I'm going to support myself through being continually creative. Those are those are two very different things that that can really take a toll on a person. The latter. Um, what's your take and experience on that, and your thoughts for moving into life after university, college, and all that? <clears throat> um. So I remember I had I recently had a conversation with a friend, and um, she was telling me how she felt like she was letting her younger self down because she she's also a creative person. She's an artist, and she felt like by being in a 9-to-5 job that she wasn't pursuing what she aspired to do as an sure. artist. But for me, I felt like I had the opposite kind of response to that, that as I am older, as I'm more aware of how things work in the world, and as I mature, I've come to realize that sometimes it's about finding the right balance that maybe I need. So even for my circumstance, because I'm here on a visa, that if I were to be a maker in this country, I would probably need to have a nine to five job and having to, I wouldn't say give up my spare time, but like my free time outside of my nine to five to pursue what I love doing right. to make stuff. And in now some why, ways, mm-hmm. wh- how's a visa influence that? Because if I want to stay in this country to continue to build a career or make stuff, I would need a full time position. So you have to work for some, you can't start your own business on I a cannot, visa here? Unless so you I have, have to five, be an employee. Um, unless I have half a million dollar capital yeah. or a million Mom dollar <laughs> capital um, in a high density area to do an investment visa, which um, wow. I think is how Elon Musk came to the United ah, States. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I did not know that. Look at that. There are a lot of weird visas in this country. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So how do you deal with, uh, so you, I guess you kind of answered that. So you, you feel yourself losing interest in a medium and to say inspired, you intentionally move to kind of another medium to move things around that way. I think I'm more excited in learning, learning a set of skills or like say, speak a new language as in picking up a different medium Mm -hmm. understanding the fundamentals of it and try to relate it with something else and see what I can come up with. Right. In, in creating is, is there anything that you're coming back to as a foundational thing that you're continually trying to communicate? Like any commonality in all the things you create? I think there is. I mean, it's always an ongoing journey of trying to figuring that out. Um, There's a part of me that kind of, I think, ever since um, seeing counseling a couple years ago, I've been more proactive in kind of looking at my work and reflecting on what does it mean to me. So something something I ask myself in every project is two questions. The first one is, why am I making this? And I want that to be a very honest and personal response that like, maybe it's just because I like it, maybe because it makes me happy. And if it is, why does it make me happy? 
But then the second question would be, why should people care about this body of work? That like, mm. because bottom line is, it's so easy to say that my demographic for my work is myself, like because it makes me happy. And I mean, there's it's it's valid, but at the same time, realistically speaking, if you're putting it out there and there's an audience who's looking at your work, they need to get something out of it too. Right. So I often have to ask myself these two questions to really understand why I'm making what I'm making, and more importantly, why does it matter to someone that this work exists? Because otherwise, like everyone could just produce things in the world, you know. Right. We just, just keep be filled making with stuff, which pretty things that don't mm -hmm. relate. See, but I think that there's enough commonality in the hopes, dreams, fears, and all that each one of us have intrinsically as a human that if we're truly communicating uh, or if we're exploring and honestly exploring our experience, that what comes out of that will connect with others uh, just for that single reason. I don't know. I agree with you. But like, again, I think I'm looking at it in more realistic terms, like, you know, who knows 50 years later or like when I die, that someone finds value in, oh, apparently this is meaning, but he's dead, so we can't right. support him anymore. So <laughs> realistically speaking, I kind of have to convince people that, I mean, this body of work matters, like it relates to us, so support me while I'm still alive, I guess, you know? Right. Now, I guess I can't t completely say this statement with it being true throughout, but having not gone to school as specifically to produce an artist's vision. I, mm -hmm. I went to school for architecture, which is far more, in my opinion, taking other people's needs and translating them into what is kind of art, but the built environment, and of course. Uh, but how have you found an art education to interact with your natural creativity like how do they what is what is the general push about and around developing that creativity how do you teach that or do you just mentor foster and form it or i think that's a good question because i think about that all the time and um after going through my bfa and subsequently my mfa i'm very close to coming to this conclusion that going to art school is not about it's not like going to trade school and then being good at a medium mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I think art school to me like what I've gotten out of it so far is understanding the art world knowing what the game is how to play the game and more importantly I mean people always like market art school is creative problem solving but th there's truth to that that um some a visiting artist at mecca once said that like you know being artists yourself included we are all incredibly talented people at learning new things we're so good at learning things hmm. we're so good at adapting and i think that's what's important hmm. but do you how do you see the landscape of people compared to creative people compared to not create you know I don't want to say not creative people because I view my wife as not creative <laughs> but she is when it comes to writing she's very creative and talented at that so there's I think generally everyone's creative in some manner there's just other people that seem to it seems to just not be able to not come out in everything they do right? I think creative like relating the word creativity with visual arts can be faulty at times right because right. like you said your wife can be creative with words whatever that means right. um and if we look at art visual art as a visual language it's still a language right. like someone could be creative in anything hmm. that you know like when you're good at something to a certain point it is you kind of make it into an art Right. Does it mean it's like capital A fine art that should be in a gallery? Not really, but people could find the beauty in someone's passion 
and that's how I view it. So a friend of mine that, that train studied somewhat as a painter as well, intentionally decided not to become a artist in that sense because he didn't feel he had enough of a voice as an artist. D do you get what he's saying and do you, um, not because, well, it was Caleb, you know, <laughs> uh, but do you understand that comment and know what your own voice is? Um, I think I understand that comment and it's kind of like picking a battle, right? Like, do you want to take on this battle to search for the voice that matters that people want to listen to? Or do you shift your focus to something where like maybe like shifting from art to architecture is speaking a different language where he finds his voice, right? Like maybe we can boil everyone down into a checklist of things. I'm five foot seven on a good day. I take photos and then, you know, everyone has their own list of like a checklist of things that defines them. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess what I'm getting at is knowing your checklist, being content with it and figuring out what makes you stand out with your checklist. Does that make sense? I think so. It I, I have a hard time identifying, I, I have a hard time identifying as an artist because what I do is very commercial, but I, I like to work in the realm of creativity mm -hmm. and I have a slightly odd mix, I think of being very, uh, driven and enjoy the creative part of figuring out how to make money mm -hmm. at while doing a creative mm -hmm. thing. I think you're an artist. I, I create things. Um, You've got a body of work over there. <laughs> it's been on Peter Pixel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'd, I'd like to do more of it, but I get sidetracked by these things that are actually paying for things. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have a, a very strong drive to um, not be starving and to be able to feed the children, you know? And the uh, four cars. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, so are, have you just already decided in your mind, I'm going to find a job that works for me and then I'm going to pursue my passion as an artist outside of that? I think so. I mean, I feel like over the years I've kind of built up a toolbox of skills mm -hmm. and it's pretty wide which puts me in a pretty versatile position so I'm not concerned about my options in my career and I know that because every piece of tool that I've put in my toolkit is something that I've enjoyed and is marketable so I don't know it's tough because I'm still like in the job hunt I mean as an artist I like telling people that being an artist and being unemployed, my best way to frame it is being in between projects. <laughs> I'm in between projects. Yeah, right I'm, in, I'm in between projects right now. So without really having a current employment or like a career that I'm working towards, it's kind of hard to answer that question right now. Right. <laughs> um, ten, from, uh, 10 years from now, what do you think you'll regret having not done enough of or doing too much of regret is a very like tricky idea because I try not to have regrets mm -hmm. um, what's done is done and whatever mistakes I've made either contributes to a good story or to who I am today or a great learning experience which yeah is yeah who you are today. more to put in your memoir or something right. um but 10 years from now, I think one thing that I have not regret, but lamented was um, not knowing that. So Rochester Institute of Technology um, offers an undergraduate study called scientific photography. 
and going through the curriculum, I was just enamored by it. But I was like, maybe in my senior year of my BFA right. and felt like it's too late. Um, but at the same time, I looked at the curriculum and I felt like I have a basic understanding of maybe a quarter of the syllabus just because of how passionate I was about what I wanted to do. Now, by scientific photography, do they mean like lab photos? I mean, as far as like yeah. photographing kind of mitochondria like, kind of thing or the mm -hmm. science of photography? Probably a little bit of both. Yeah. That um, they kind of like looking at, say, if a camera's a pencil, someone can write with it. Someone mm -hmm. can stab someone with it. Someone could draw with it. And as artists, we are trained to use that pencil to draw and... I think that program I would relate to you learning how to learning, understanding what the pencil is doing, what it could help us with and learning how to write very, um, technical with it and making charts and whatnot, I guess is how I would put it. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea of knowing the camera as a tool, both as a creative medium, but also as a like measuring tool. Hmm. Interesting. Um, where are you at now that you finished your MFA? Mm -hmm. uh, where are you at now? What are you What are you looking at and hoping to do? You think I'm in between projects in right between now. Between projects, yeah. Um, but I have started a new project. So um, over the years, I've had this kind of like side hobby of um, photographing art. That's where the um, using the pencil as a different method. Uh, right, a far more technical documentary. Yeah, than like using it to draw. Right. Basically sketching other people's drawings with the Which, pencil. Which, interestingly, I think architectural photography has a dimension of that. I've always kind of thought that, you know, I'm, I'm creatively documenting someone else's work of art. Mm -hmm. So there's... There's a degree of that in architectural photography, I think, where I, I don't want to make my voice too loud. Mm -hmm. Also, it's going to be about the photograph rather than the subject in the photograph. It's kind of like a weird space that you and I exist in because to make your voice most distinct, you have to be invisible, right? right? And right now I'm starting a project. While still being consistent. Yeah. Um, to have an invisible voice that's loud. It, it's just, it's something I'm still grappling and thinking kind about. Kind of a background radiation to a degree. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Um, I started a writing project called Notes on Documenting Art. A writing project? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm writing, like, I don't want to call it a book. I don't want to put that pressure of a book has to be certain inches thick, certain dimensions. Right. I just want it to be a document for now. And if it's big enough to be a booklet, a zine, or maybe an actual book, sure. But um, trying to keep it realistic, not trying to give it any substance yet, but a writing project where I reflect on what I've learned teaching myself how to document art. Mm -hmm. And I intend to include you in it. Oh, Yeah, nice. so... Um, one part of it, I wanted to talk about my belief that as someone who um, documents art, I ought to have um, an art background or know how to speak the language. Hmm. Because if I look at documenting art as um, being a translator between like, say someone's a Spanish English translator, except in my case, I am a translator for a visual artist to help um, describe a work of art through images rather than writing, right? Right. Then I ought to speak the language, and it makes no sense for a Spanish-English translator to not speak yeah. Spanish. Yeah, yeah. He said some stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, right? yeah b a behind-the-scenes photographer is exactly that for the documentary project. Yeah, I think so, and... Yeah. This is where I pull you in. I know that you're an architectural photographer, but you also have a background in architecture that in some ways I think your work 
speaks to architects because you oh, speak the language. Huge. And I, I would not be doing what I'm doing today and able to pay my bills if I didn't have the architectural background, I don't think. Because mm -hmm. I've run into a lot of people that have a photo background that are working some other job with nothing to do with photography. The, the ability to speak their language, uh, to know the pain that they go through to operate their business and to get anywhere with it, you know, and to be able to speak the same words about the same details and, you know, that that's huge. And I think like that whole like translator slash interpreter analogy really fits quite well with what I'm working because there are times where I talk to um, an artist and they say, the previous photographers have made my work look really flat. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show translucence. I wanted to pop. I want to have a 3D effect. Right. Like, and I'm not in a position to tell them, you can't have 3D in flat photos, right? So then it becomes my responsibility or my role that they've like wanted me to work with them um, to document their art. Then it becomes my responsibility to help emphasize those qualities that they see in their work right. through the images and in the same vein i am helping them describe their work visually that yeah. it gives the same qualities that they've worked towards right and and they presumably wouldn't be coming to you if they didn't like the look of what you've already done to i be think in that so. position anyways and funny enough um I think some of where my projects shine the most were the ones that are kind of like related to what I do. So you know that I have a lot of, um, I'm really interested and enjoy making photos in the dark at night. Hmm. And I have had a couple of projects that involve artworks that glow, like including my own personal work, yeah, light emitting yeah, objects and how to really embrace the shadows hmm. has kind of become um, a niche of mine. Yeah. The, there was a, there was a piece kind of like that in the lobby of the Colby art museum a while ago when we photographed their lobby, that was really interesting that they just kind of put off the wall. It was a large, I think it was like a scrolling text piece actually. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, it didn't have any additional lighting on it or anything else, but it just kind of stood out. It was very minimalist on it. Um, I remember thinking that that was interesting, but I don't know what to do with it other than put it in a museum, you know? I, I don't really have a house big enough to, or a wallet big enough to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what What is art to you at, it, at its essence? Art is, um, I think because of my studies and how I've kind of like, my creative trajectory has happened over the years that I'm really interested in looking at art also as a way of documenting. Like it is a documentary no matter what, because if someone's making stuff, it has to be founded on something they know and something they know exists in the world, kind of. You know what I'm saying? I think so. But I mean, like at a, a philosophical level, like what does art, if you're documenting something, you're still looking at a subject. Is art for you a way of expressing your experience then? It is. Like, I mean, for me currently, my projects kind of feel like personal diaries or reflections, right. observations. But I guess in a more philosophical way, I look at art as evidence of living, like evidence of existence that like all works of art point to like fundamentally art doesn't really just come out of nowhere someone made it and that art will always have the fundamental definition of someone made this thing right. and that's how i kind of approach everything hmm. it's kind of yeah i mean someone a built a of, building right record of life mm -hmm. that's interesting uh where where are you giddy with technical things these days giddy giddy what do you mean? Excited about and like, whoo, have you seen this? <laughs> um, so you had Tim read my website. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't have him do it. He does that on his own. 
He's good, oh, good like for that. him. Oh, he's self-motivated. <laughs> um, he's got his headphones on, so he can't hear us. Oh no, he'll hear us when we edit the video. <laughs> yeah, he'll. Oh. So last semester, um, I was a TA for a digital audio recording, mm -hmm. and I picked up music production. Ooh, fun yeah. stuff. Yeah, I have an analog synthesizer at home. Nice. Um, what kind of microphone is this? Sure, fifty-eight. SM, I have an SM57. Mm. Same capsule. Yeah. They sound largely the same, but this is more for vocals, and then yeah. SM57 is more for instruments. Instruments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got this one like over a decade ago for recording music, mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, well, I already got this one. I'll use it for the podcast, and I'll just get another one. I couldn't find one that didn't have the switch on it when I was looking, so I just got the one with the switch, but oh. I didn't like the switch, but whatever. <laughs> Is that why I have this microphone? Subconsciously, maybe. <laughs> like, I don't want to talk into the switch. I like it nice and clean. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I started messing around with music again. And one of the things that made me giddy is finding out there's a very specific thing that exists in the world, that um, someone built a MIDI controller in a form of a harmonica. Okay. Isn't that now, bizarre? Now, talk me through MIDI controller, because I know MIDI sounds from what minimal, like, little recording experience I have. And But are they just synthesized, uh, pre-recorded, computer-generated sounds? Yeah, with my equally limited understanding, like, think of a MIDI controller as a piano keyboard in the form of a computer keyboard. So it's really just recording the keys, how long you press it, um, the velocity of which you press it, mm -hmm. and then translate that to a set of sounds that are like a package of sounds. Okay. It could be a synthesizer. It could be like... Arnold Schwarzenegger saying things? Probably. You could just like map every single syllable right. and make some weird sounds. But So that's kind of the idea of a MIDI controller to be able to input... So they Notes. they kind of map that into the workings of a harmonica, and by yeah. interacting with the harmonica, it makes these other sounds. Yeah, and you like blow into the harmonica, you draw notes in the harmonica, press right. buttons, and it works like a keyboard. Wait, keyboard? I thought it was a harmonica. Yeah, but they all they all make no uh, sounds, right? Okay, but they all like the keys of the keyboard. It would be as if you were playing the keyboard, but you're playing a harmonica. Say, like, you're oh, okay. playing a song. You yep. can play it with, like, the keyboard, do, re, mi, fa, so. Yeah. Or you can play in a harmonica, like, blow, draw, move, blow, draw, move, yeah. blow. Yeah, uh, okay. Same idea, but someone made a MIDI controller in a form of a harmonica. And so instead of getting harmonica sounds, you can get programmable MIDI mm -hmm. stuff, and you generate it through blowing through the harmonica. Yeah, like, imagine, you know, Daft Punk. Mm-hmm. Imagine like Daft Punk playing like a live show, but instead of a keyboard, they're all just playing harmonica. There's a cable into a well, big Well, it'd be computer. hard though because they have the masks. Oh, that's a good point. Right? Well, some <laughs> electronic artist who doesn't have a mask, which is hard to find nowadays for some reason. Right? right? Everyone yeah, wants a mask. Dead Mao and yeah. Even Buckethead has, has a right. mask. He's old school though, isn't he? I mean. He was recently in Portland. Do you know that? Really? Yeah. Huh. He's. British or something, isn't he? I don't know, but if you go on his Wikipedia page, he cranks out hundreds of albums a year. What? Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre things you can find in the internet. Uh, yeah. I, I know many people who get sucked into those, like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to... Like, I'll occasionally get sucked into boxing videos for some reason. Boxing? No interest in boxing, but like... Like, like boxing the sport yeah not unboxing no no i, I got into a brief period of like you know watching people. yeah unboxing videos see the thing with me with unbox it seems like kittens and unboxing videos are big on the internet and i just don't i i don't get it in that like yeah but why? you're a dog person no i like kitten videos don't get me wrong i'm talking mm -hmm. more of the unboxing i mean kittens are cute but they are nest parasites essentially <laughs> um dogs aren't that much different but still like there's there's weird things with cats that if you look at it from a very biological perspective and how parasites work 
Like I'm scared now. Cats are like very much so. And then, and they carry a lot of weird parasites and stuff. And they think they do weird things to people too. I mean, you did you ever read the uh, National Geographic uh, article on parasites? No. Like, I think it was called animal zombies and like wasps that like will land on cockroaches, inject their stinger into the cockroach's brain and be able to remote control them and ride them into their nest so their young can feed on them. I mean, crazy stuff like worms and crickets that put out this thing in the cricket so it wants to get into water and drown and then the worm can come out and go to its next stage of development in the water. Uh, A parasite that can only develop in the stomach of a cat so it starts out in a mouse, but then it releases something in the mouse that makes the mouse attracted to cat urine. So then it will go where cats are and get eaten. And then the parasite can develop in the cat's stomach after that. I mean, all these really weird things and cats kind of play into that in a weird way. So I think there might be something to cat people. Should we know. rename the podcast to um, <laughs> Parasites and Cats? Yeah, Parasites <laughs> and Cats and uh, whatever the... Cantonese, <laughs> Cantonese pop. What was it? Oh boy, the, Cantonese pop music. Yeah, the power ballads. There's only power ballads. Two decades. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so, in your finding, let's say you find your perfect nine to five job. What are you going to be focusing on creatively starting out? You think? <coughs> what do you? If you could paint the perfect picture to what you'd like to be doing. Um. So I've been thinking about that lately. I think my long-term goal is to have um, a studio and my own personal practice specializing in uh, documenting art, Mm -hmm. but I also want to afford enough time to be teaching at a college level. Cool. Now, why, why the draw to teaching? I think it's partially because of my graduate studies, like um, with an MFA, I earn a terminal degree in fine art. And I could teach at a college level. Mm -hmm. So like that just kind of got me thinking like, well, I have this degree now. Like I pretty much have opened the doors to, it's not necessarily like a very high paid job, but it's not a bad job either. Right. Well, it's a job that you continually be in and teaching and more deeply embedding the philosophies of art and the process of art and creation Mm -hmm. into yourself and with others Mm -hmm. that could only benefit, I would think, your production outside of that. Yeah, and I think because of my trajectory um, that I'm not really given the freedom to be a full-time creative artist, that it was never my intention to be one. Um, So I started thinking about how do I contribute to the arts without being an artist like to make stuff put in a gallery occasionally be in a museum I don't know Um, I started thinking about what I do why I like doing them and how others could benefit and I've kind of like come to the conclusion that as much as I like having creative practice as much as I like making stuff I'm more interested in the peripherals of being an artist like what are the peripherals of being an artist to you I think I'm interested in teaching um, young artists things outside of making stuff. Okay. Like um, like how to think about it? I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to keep it pretty open just because I don't want to limit myself into a very specific thing, and yep. that's all I do. But one thing I could uh, kind of relate to it is my role as a art documentarian um, – is to promote the idea that when you're done with that final brushstroke on a painting, um, when you're done printing your work, that's not the end of it. You also need to know how to package it nicely and archive it. Mm -hmm. Say, um, have it professionally photographed. Um, Know how to write about your work. Uh, package it well so when you submit it to shows or to a different organizer who may want to see or acquire your work, they understand what your work is and they could also convey that message effectively to others. Hmm. And I really want to um, promote that 
And so that, that realm of the art community to you is very interesting. Yeah. And I think, um, it's probably also just because I was surrounded by artists that I got into what I do today, Mm -hmm. documenting art, but also like one of the things that I find really valuable was that by affording myself to document art, I have a very intimate and unique way to interface with a work of art to really like have a pillow talk with a work of art that I really spend a lot of time getting to know something in order to know how to translate it to someone or document it. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of this in, in the realm of, in this conversation, I keep imagining, I think a couple times I've documented, um, just paintings and it's like, just make sure everything's even, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and do it that way, unless it's a very textured piece of art and then you need Mm to create some shadows and stuff. But, um, but it goes far beyond that. I, I would assume then that, that, you know, documenting a uh, sculptural piece or a neon piece or whatever, uh, is going to, yeah, it's just a much bigger world than I would have previously thought. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think some point in my career I kind of thought to myself I like documenting art because it's a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. but in a very specific theme right right like um documenting a gallery opening or performance piece is like event photography you're like dealing with people moving around it's like a one chance kind of thing whereas documenting a smaller three-dimensional objects feels like you know product photography you've got your like your sweep your lights um, and then going into something that's like flat work, like say if there's a painting in a gallery or a museum, that's like copy work. So it kind of gives you a taste of everything you could do as a commercial photographer, but still be adhered to your practice, which was incredibly rewarding for me because at the end of the day, that also feeds back to my understanding of art. Right. Now, where do you think, and value the the uh, the balancing of the technical and the creative, right? Because with photographers, you'll run into these people that are just all about the technical, and they're just into the latest gear, and they're just obsessed with it far more so than the creation of images that move people. It seems you know they'll just be gearheads to to the nth degree. And then there'll be people that are just, they could care less about all that stuff. And it's all about whatever emotive you can create uh, at the end of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. For you, where's that, where's that balance in your interest lie? Oddly enough, I think I'm kind of an even split between the two. I would, I would say that too. Yeah. Like as much as I enjoy making art through making images, I'm also so invested in the technical aspects of it. Nowadays, like, so I've, I've had a camera with me since I was eight. Hmm. Yeah. Um, And nowadays there's not really much gear lust, if you will. Granted, I have um, acquired a series of tools that I feel like are capable. Right. And they're by no means like What do you think of that new... Fuji medium format. It's only like ten grand. Have you you seen know, that? I've I've looked into those. Um, unfortunately, knowing my work, you know how wide my photos get. Yeah. Because of how square the sensor is, it doesn't really like make much sense for me to have one as a um, camera with me. Right. If anything, I do a lot of um, stitching panoramas. To, yeah. Like, in our work too, mm-hmm. we we basically would make the same image. We just stitch w- using the tilt shift lenses. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that it's worth it to me to, you know, sell all my gear and, and get that when I could have the option of doing square or like you're saying, very panoramic. Cause mm-hmm. we do that a lot. And I, I really like that versatility, but, but anyways, the intersection of technical and creative, it seems like with you, you're, you're very capable and interested in the technical, but, you can obviously show on the other side, you create these very interesting 
emotive images that maybe come through that very technically interested filter. I don't know. I think they feed into each other that because of how invested and I will have to put a disclaimer, like I'm very technically invested in digital photography because like I don't really do much film photography. I have complete respect for people who do it and do it really well. It doesn't intrigue me as much as digital because it kind of feels more mathematical. It's really exciting to think of the idea that, you know, at the end of the day, your JPEG has what? Red, green, blue channels. You have 256 values in each of them. You can really quantify like the luminosity of things. Um, so that, that really intrigues me versus the film counterpart. And I think, so one thing I want to write about in Notes on Documenting Art is to include this glossary of terms that artists use to describe their work hmm. and how I would interpret it in photography. And I feel like interesting by having my um, technical proficiency, I am able to emulate certain qualities that translate to emotions to people. So it's really about right. breaking down the language and then reconstructing it backwards right to get so, the same thing th almost a, s a scientific process mm -hmm. to then uh inform your process mm -hmm. right and i often thought about that in um architecture school when they talk about the shapes of different spaces or exteriors and how they would you know generally make people feel it seems like they'd have more scientific research on that where like this percentage of the population when faced with a oval space rather than, or, you know, feels this way. And like the, the experience of the arts would be more objectively studied, but it is such a subjective realm. Maybe the people that pull the strings in that art realm are kind of offended by the idea of objectifying any of it. I think it's, there are like two camps of it. There are like two two different means to an end to think of like say I don't really have specific examples but just kind of imagine artist A who doesn't really know much about the technicals of stuff like they probably say oh I don't care I just make the stuff and they're really good at making the stuff right and their work is compelling and people could through you know um, critical theory unpack why the work is powerful and then on the other hand you have artist B who is so technically proficient, they could give the illusion or impression of anything. Hmm. Even though it's not like, I don't want to say it's not from the heart, but it's not where it comes uh, from. I, I see what you're saying there. And it to me, uh, Amber and I, my wife, Amber and I were just in London and we went through the National Gallery, mm -hmm. National Portrait Gallery or National Gallery, whichever. Um, and it was really interesting to look at the different time periods of art. And there was one that I think it was around the late 1400s where some Duke or other was getting his horse painted and something went wrong in the process. Like they cut the funding for finishing the thing or something. And it's a big piece, but it stopped somewhere and it was on just this very kind of yellow negative space with the horse rearing up in the middle of it hmm. and it's the first piece in that era or you know time that it was like that I've seen that it, it, it almost looked like modern art I mean very much so that it was just this horse that you could barely see kind of a little bit of shadow off its two feet that were still on the ground mm -hmm. connecting it to the negative yellow space and but it was painted with all this um you know very very realistic still from that you know period realism you know and, and to me after going through all these other paintings of all these greek stories of these weird ancestral moral situations and you know they were all visual recreations of all these either rich families just getting themselves painted or artists reflecting back on religious or philosophical or um narrative stories from Greek mythology and everything. 
uh, it was the first one that was just kind of like, it was, it was a visual expression there or felt like it felt more like modern art. And it was really, to mm -hmm. me, it was like, wow, this is really interesting and, it, and very calming at the same time, but very also, it's just a huge, beautiful, muscular horse, but the background was incomplete kind of thing. Yeah, but it was really nice. I mean, I think that goes back to what I was saying about art being an evidence, right? like of existence that it drew you to it because it stood out to you that it told a story of an artist was commissioned to make a painting of a horse but couldn't finish it and it's like that evidence of circumstances that stood out to you i mean like granted right. we could also argue about the incompleteness being against this kind of western hemisphere of making art because we know that like the eastern hemisphere of art there's this idea called lao uh, ba in Cantonese, mm -hmm. um, which is leaving things white. Like you see um, watercolor paintings. You don't prime a piece of like uh, paper. You just leave it as white the way right. it is. So this idea of the negative space being untouched is not seen in the Western hemisphere of um, art making, at least not in that time period. So right. that kind of like drawing of lines and creating this weird deviation from what we know of as history creates an impression. At least that's how I would interpret right. your experience with it. Yeah, it was, it was interesting to see the, the very literal realism mm -hmm. and the full picture, you know, being painted mm -hmm. that referenced something beyond that and then going kind of more, you know, very much more minimalist, but saying less literally by mm -hmm. creating more minimalism within the visual space of creativity it was, it was it's interesting like how that within our history of us as humans is this one thing and it and it translates into more modern art now that's this extreme minimalism and everything else and art theory and in history to me is, is very interesting, but at the same time, I just 100% don't get it at the, mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, but I, I do find that really good art seems to come from people who are questioning and struggling mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, do you think it, it because it shows emotions or shows like the human side of things? I think, a. Uh, a lot of that observation comes from my own background of being involved with a culture from my religious upbringing that had all the answers. Mm -hmm. So a true exploration into art was kind of needless. And so the arts within that realm seemed kind of impotent mm -hmm. and just kind of meh. Like, and it, it just seems like that this more emotive, beautiful creation came from uh, a more honest place of the reality of the struggle of being human, whereas the, the more uh, certain cultures don't really produce as, as much mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's more so they produce, we know everything already, and so we manufacture this over and over as in we have these morals and these ways of living that we do this and we stay within that it's a lot cleaner and it just like cookie cutter kind of thing i could you know this is just my own experience and mm -hmm. i could be totally wrong but that's what i felt and when i when i exist more in a space of admitting i don't know i have been wrong here's the times i was wrong sorry for that and here's the things I don't know. Mm -hmm. To me, the honest intersection of all those situations produces something that's more engaging. Uh, communicating and sharing your fears and your failures um, uh, in, in a brave way. So sh sharing fear, but in a courageous way. Being honest and open about it, I think creates art, creates exploration that is more uh, emotive, more moving. And, and has more value to it, in my opinion. I think good art should raise questions. Uh, yeah. Because a lot of times, like, art that doesn't ask questions, that just kind of gives you a statement, makes you feel good, but it kind of ends there, you know? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, in, in the same way, there's philosophies in advertising, I guess, that uh, are kind of like confuse and explain within the, mm -hmm. you know, so with a photograph, they'll use something to completely confuse you and you see it and it's almost comically weird but then with the text they'll explain it and then it's like oh and then you give them the logo and they're like thanks logo have you ever experienced um an architecture that raises questions like not just like structurally you know what i'm saying but but how how so like just experientially uh yeah. like the movement through it and everything um i've never been to that uh what is it, the Remington house or something where whoever, someone made the repeating rifle and killed billions of people or something and the heir to the fortune like was tortured by it or, and they made her like a super weird house that had like hallways that got smaller and all this weird stuff. Um, I don't know that I've ever, ever experienced anything like that. I've, I haven't been to the Getty Museum in, um, drawing a blank i think it's bilbao bilbao i don't know in spain um you know that that's a very you know far different experience than our normal like 90 degree walls mm -hmm. and stuff um in in all the architecture i've experienced we went to i think it was a chair museum in germany somewhere that that had a lot of circular shapes to it and was very confusing. The Modern Art Museum in uh, Boston, down in the Seaport District, I think, that was, a, to me, a slightly confusing building to interact with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't like the experience of interacting with it, honestly, but I loved the visuals of it. Mm -hmm. But there was something about moving through the space and looking at the art that was like, it didn't let my the part of my brain that just wants to move through a space to keep seeing art relax it had to stay engaged mm -hmm. and it was just kind of uh annoying but every space of that building to me it was kind of like bad architectural photography <laughs> so the experience this is interesting the experience of that building i love that building and i've i've got images that i really like of it and I love every space of that building, but it seemed like bad architectural photography in that it was trying to dominate the experience of being there rather than being a passive means of showing the art. Now, if you contrast that with, I think, Louis Kahn's building somewhere in Texas that's a, that's a museum that, uh, boy, if anyone listens to this, I'm, I'm a pathetic excuse for knowing my architecture and architects, but um, there it's it's a much more uh as far as the experience of moving through it as i know it it's a it's a more uh not regimented but obvious layout of how to move through it mm -hmm. um and in the same way i've experienced well the equation is that or the expression is that bad architectural photography to me has too much to say about the photograph rather than accentuating hmm. just the architecture to me, the, the museum there in Boston, in my experience of it, was I was experiencing the building more than the art in it. And so it was taken away from the art, right? Um, and in the same way that I had to keep my mind active just for making my way through the building in that, um, I'm finding now that I've stepped back and I'm re-examining and intellectualizing my worldview, losing my faith, basically, uh, it engages parts of me uh, to process everything going on and doesn't allow me to be present as much because I'm constantly processing what everything means and why everything is and why should, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm, I should have been able to put all that stuff, not behind me, but I, I should have been able to get a hold of all that stuff through my impressionable years and then use that map to process the rest of my life, not have to dig it back up and retool, recalculate everything uh, to make it through. Now, maybe that's just a natural maturation process and it's what I should be going through, you know, fine, but it is exhausting and it's an emotional toll. And it's interesting to me that it relates to that process of going through 
that museum. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting aha moment there nice. <laughs> for me. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's probably a good place to end. I don't know. You, you have anything that you wanted to ask me? <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but yeah. I'm sure I'll have questions to ask you, like All whether right. it's now, later. Later. We'll have to do this again. Sure. Maybe maybe make it an annual thing to see where you're at with uh, art and documentary and oh boy. Uh, and visas and and everything else. So, do I have to like do an evaluation for of you as well? Oh yes, it, there'll be an exit exam on your way out, uh, <laughs> an evaluation form. But anyways, thanks for uh, coming down and thanks to Tim for bringing you down and arranging this. It's, it's good to see you again. Good good to catch up with you. Likewise. And, uh, Again, anyone who's interested in seeing uh, all of Joel's stuff, uh, you can follow him at Pika uh, on Instagram, and you can spell that. P P E. Uh, but yeah, he's got some really great uh, night photography stuff that I try and emulate sometimes. So check it out; it's it's eclectic and very cool. So we can talk shop in another episode. Let's talk shop again in another episode. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for coming down and thanks for watching and please subscribe and like and share and all that. Later.